wretched believers. Isn't that a great word? Wretched. What picture do you get in your mind with the word wretched? Anybody? Anybody get a picture at all? What's that? They're really down. Yeah. Yeah. Not very happy. It's one of my favorite phrases. Not very happy. Wretched. Romans 7, 24. Paul says, O oh, wretched man that I am. The Apostle Paul says that. He says that as a believer, writing the book of Romans, writing the books of the Bible, having been saved, knowing Jesus Christ, he says, O oh, wretched man that I am. Do you know that, the, that we have been, and we are, he's properly so, we have been led to believe that the Apostle Paul was a very happy, saved person. Because he was. So I'm going to tell you a story. When I was little, I have a witness, by the way. My older sister is here today. I don't know how that happened, because I did not expect to have a witness. <laughs> but I'm a preacher's kid. My dad taught the Bible. I learned it from, from infancy. It's what we did. And from the time I was little, I knew I was a sinner. And so did everybody else. <laughs> There's no question. And at a young age, I heard a message on hell and knew that I was going to hell. Probably I was like four or five. And I asked Jesus to save me at a young age. And he did. He made it very plain to me that he saved me. And yet I was still a miserable little brat. <laughs> I think of even looking at my sister. <laughs> she didn't say amen. I just remember the time she was hitting me with a boot puller because I was so bad. And I was laughing at her. Um, she probably remembers that, too. Um, here's what happened. I knew I was saved. I heard all kinds of stuff about saved people being good, and I looked in the mirror, and I didn't match up. And it was a miserable struggle. I got news for you. It still is a miserable struggle. Some of you know that I'm writing a book. You know what the title is? Sin and Forgiveness. Why? Because it's on my mind all the time. How could Jesus possibly still love this? Anybody been there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I am so prone to Wondering if this is all worth it. Been there? Why would you come to church Sunday morning when you could go out fishing? I mean, why would you even bother trying to love your neighbor when he... They don't, they don't love you back. But we'll just leave it right there, right. You, right? I mean, why would I, why would I come to church with people that are not as nice to be with as I want them to be. Why would I keep doing this? I mean, this struggle of is it worth it makes us question our faith. If you've not been there, I don't think you're alive. You get that? Even Jesus, as the cross approached, said what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
This struggle, I mean, and it was so hard for him that at least in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, he was wretched. I don't know if you get that. So, we'll get the next slide up there. I did not read verse 25 yet. I'm saving that. I'm exhausted by the struggle with my sinful fallen self, and I'm just plain sick of me. I long for relief, and I'm longing for Jesus, and it seems like he just isn't going to be there. Is the Bible really true? Why am I doing this? Is it worth it? How can I actually be saved considering how much I sin, how often I fail to love God and love my neighbor? By the way, those are just as big a sin as the Big Ten. You follow that? You say, is it as bad as lying not to love my neighbor? It's as bad as lying. It's as bad as pedophilia. I'm a miserable sinner. I hate it. By the way, you're going to say, Pastor, why are you trying to do this to us? I wanted something uplifting. Hang on. That's all I got to say. So is, if this is all so true, why am I struggling so bad? If Jesus is my victory, why don't I feel like a victor? You been there? I fell again, Lord, and again, and again, and again, and again. My knees are bleeding. You know, my hands are scuffed up and my face is bruised because I hit the rocks with my face. I'm a mess. And, I can't, and then this one. Does anybody else actually struggle like I do? How many of you think you're the only one? Yeah. I, I talk to people in the church and people tell me, Pastor, you should preach on it. This is the day. Right? Because you need to know that it's a struggle. And is God going to give up on me? Did I do it one too many times? Boy, that's one that's on my mind. I mean, thinking, what sin is the one that's going to get me in the biggest trouble? Was it that one? And how about this? I know God forgives, but he can't forgive that. So, in the Bible, there's a guy named Gideon. I love Gideon. He is a judge of, actually, he's like you guys. He's afraid. And he's a believer. And he's living defeated. And the world is out to get him. And God shows up to him I just love it. God shows up to him and says, you mighty man of valor. And he goes, what have you been smoking? Right? Because Gideon's not a man of valor. At least in Gideon's eyes, he's a coward. And he says, God is with you. And Gideon goes, oh, really? God is with me. So Gideon then says, if God is really with me, why? All this trouble, I paraphrase. Like, you can look it up. If, if God is with me, why is there so much wrong with my world and with me? <laughs> I've been there. Live there, kind of like at my second address. And Gideon is at least a little bit of a believer. Most of us are a little bit of a believer in Jesus Christ. You follow that? Most of us know that God is real. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for sinners. We believe he rose from the dead. We believe it's true. Yet, Gideon, as a believer, is still messed up. Do you know that his family has idols? 
and he goes to worship with his family with those idols, at least he attends. <laughs> Do you know that you have idols? What do you love more than God? Right? Where do you go when you want comfort? Relief? Do you go to God or do you go something else? That's an idol. I mean, but they have, an, they have actual idols. And God, in this conversation, actually tells Gideon, go destroy them. And he goes, no, 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 they'll kill me. <laughs> right? I mean, pastor, don't you dare touch my idol. <laughs> right? Um, and here's, and here's what, what else. Gideon knows the stories about God's history with God's people. He says, where is the God of our fathers and the miracles that he did? He believes they're true. Hang on to this thought. Gideon believes the miracles are true. He's heard the testimonies of God doing stuff in other people's lives and knows and believes that it's all true. It's just not true for him. Anybody been there? Yeah. Let me tell you something. God comes to Gideon deliberately because he says, Gideon, I want you to know it's true for you. As you are, it's true for you. You know that song, it's we saying, if you tarry till you're ready, you will never come at all. Well, you won't. Gideon didn't go to God. God came to him and said, <laughs> I'm here. And I want you, Gideon, to do something incredible. I want your name listed on those testimonies, those stories. Do you know what happens after Gideon's done doing all this wonderful stuff for God? He messes up again. He builds an idol that everybody goes to. He calls it, he says it's only representation of God, but he builds an idol. And the people go to the representation of God rather than to God. I think that I can relate to Gideon. I think God's using me sometimes, and I'm still messing up. By the way, worshiping God and idols at the same time is not a good thing. I don't think it makes God happy. It's kind of like being married to one person and having a girlfriend. <clears throat> Doesn't work very well. You know why God uses messed up people like you and I? Anybody know? Raise your hand if you know why God uses messed up people. Well, what's that now? We've been there. Yes, but, but, but why would he use us? I, I, you actually didn't answer. That was a different answer than I was looking for, but that was a good answer. I took, I took me a minute. Beth. Who said that? It's all he's got to work with. You, you know that's true, right? God <laughs> hasn't got anybody to work with but sinners. John. If God can take David under what he certainly can take you. And I believe that. And he wants to. That's the thing. I mean, Gideon, can, I think Gideon must have wondered, part of him said, God, do you really want me? And you know what? It even profited Gideon. I, physically, it, he became kind of rich out of this mess. Not that God made me rich or anything, but you understand it can happen. Because God... God, I love it in Jeremiah, I know that God says this, I know the plans that I have for you, and they're good. <laughs> to me, a sinner, 
He says, I've got good plans for you, David. And I can tell you right now, I've, had, I've tasted of that goodness. As a sinner, I'm going to be honest with you, some of my greatest blessings have come after my moments of greatest sin in my mind. If I was God, I'd say, you're not getting any blessing until next year. <laughs> or two years from now, or ten years from now. But he blesses me. And I am so pleased with his blessing. By the way, that's, we're going to be preaching on blessing in the few, in next couple months. I mean, let me tell you another secret. All that wonderful stuff is true, that Jesus loves me, uses me, and I still get sick of being me. I still get sick of failing. I get sick of saying, God, I'm sorry. I said that yesterday 20 times, and he said, well, it wasn't enough. <laughs> you know? And I do get sick of it. And I say, well, God must be sick of it too, so I'm just going to not do anything. And then I back up, and I go, God, I'm not coming to you today. And he says, David. How do you like it, David, without me, me in the middle of your... I don't like it. He says, then say I'm sorry. No. Anybody have a little kid that way? <laughs> Say something, kid. Look at me. <laughs> yes, God, I'm looking. <laughs> I, I'm being dramatic because I want you to get how real this is. And for me, it really is real. So I come back to God and I say, I'm sorry and I know you forgave me, the cross, all my sins are forgiven and I'm sorry. But God, was I sorry enough? Anybody done that one? And you know what, it's a stupid question. I'm, I'm just telling you right now, asking yourself, am I sorry enough is a stupid question. And if you're a parent and you ask your kid if they're sorry enough, don't do that. Take the win. Right? They said they're sorry. You say, thank you. It's a win. It's a Bible win. So if you don't believe what I just said is true, If you don't believe that, what I, that the Bible says this is true, read the book of Hosea. Hosea is the picture of God's relationship with you and I with our sinful, bad behavior, and it's pretty ugly. Hosea's wife, Gomer, represents us, and she's not doing good. And Hosea represents God and his love for us. And she gets so far from him and God says in Hosea 14, I just love this. He says to us, take with you words and say them. You say, is that all God wants? Say something. Just like the kid that won't speak when you, they've been, you know, they got caught. God says, and he says, all you, if you say the words, I will heal their backsliding, and I will put up with them. That's not what it says. What kind of a God do we have? I will just lavish my love on them. I will heal their backsliding. Um, and you know, it does help to meet it a little bit. But who does it help to mean it? God or you? You. The more you confess, the more likely you are to try not to do it again. Read Hosea 14. Say the right things, and maybe they'll sink in a little bit. And you say, people are deceptive. No kidding. 
right? I will manipulate to get all I can out of somebody. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? God doesn't care. He knows us. Isn't that so incredible? Just like you know your kid who's manipulating you by saying, I'm sorry. Can I have my dessert now? Right? Well, you said they could if they said sorry. So give them the dessert. The dessert. And don't, don't belittle them while you're doing it, which is what we, lo- we like to do that. Um, <clears throat> So God says, I will heal, I will love them freely. Those are so, those are the, I love hearing that. I will love them freely. But we are prone to backsliding, and it is not a pretty thing. How many of you here know anything about backsliding, what it represents? Yeah. How many of you know what, 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 it's, what is it referring to? Anybody want to tell me? I mean, I, I, I know what backsliding feels like, so let me give you a little hint. Here we go. Next, there we go. For Israel, that is God's people, slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now, that, I looked for a picture of the way I worked on a farm, and I know a thing or two about heifers. And the ones that I know the most about when they were little calves, the farmer put them out in the field and left them alone for months. You know what that does to a heifer? It grows their bad behavior. They get stubborn, and then he said, we're going to get the heifers and bring them to the barn. And he took the truck over there, and there was a ramp on the truck, and I'm going to be a little graphic. There's stuff on the ramp that's slippery. And you know how hard it is to put a heifer up on a ramp that doesn't, he doesn't want to go up there? And it's slippery. He, the farmer I worked for used a shovel. <laughs> and they still, I mean, we had a rope, a shovel, and we pushed, and it was an experience. Well, God says, you backslide like that. I'm trying to move you this way, and you're doing that. And I think it's true. I think it's true. That's my own experience of this, of me. See, I too resist God flipping backwards in my mess all the time. How many of you, get, how many of you even if you're not really sorry, get sick of the mess you made? Amen. I'm just sick of my mess. Say, I'm sorry, and ask God to clean you up. And you, and you say, well, he's going to do it again. We have a baby back here. Do you know that the babies make messes? And we don't tell them, don't do it again? Get over yourself. You know what Acts 6.51 says? To God's people, you stiff necks and, and uncircumcised of heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Amen. We used to play um, uncle. See who'd give in the first? I played uncle with God. I've told you some of those stories. The time I lied to the police about running my, backing my truck into a Mercedes Benz and taking the doors out, and I got away with it. They believed me that I didn't do it. But I was playing uncle with God. And for a week, he made me miserable until I confessed. Because God knows how to win when he plays uncle. I'm just telling you the truth. We are prone to backsliding. It's not a pretty thing at all. Not at all a pretty thing. So we're getting there to the end of this. 
Can I tell you something that's really great? You cannot mess up your relationship with God. You cannot do it. He is committed to you. But you can certainly mess up the moments. And I've done that many times. And Paul calls this struggle in the moment wretched. See, if you read Romans 7, the previous part, Paul's talking about his struggle with sin. I can't stop doing the wrong thing, and I can't keep doing the right thing, and I just, I'm a, I mess it up all the time. And he finishes with, oh, wretched man that I am. Ah, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He hates the struggle as much as I do, if not more. You know, the gospel is simple. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. It's that wonderful. It is that wonderful. Even though I have victory right now, I have a conflict right now. So then, with my mind, I know it's all true and I belong to God. I know that, but with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. Or I know I belong to God, and I believe it, but I struggle to live it. Even after saying we have the victory, that is still true. And you have to accept that. You have to accept that it's true. You don't have any choice, or you're going to be more miserable. We're almost done. I'm going to keep this moving. See, like Gideon, I struggle in my, with what I know to be true and what I experience in my moments. I know there's a God in heaven whose goodness is in control. And you're not unique in your struggle with this. You're at least in it with pastor. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. I'm going to paraphrase it. Every problem you have is common to everybody else. No matter how much of a front they put on, if you're struggling with it, they probably struggle with it. But God... Hallelujah, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted or tested or tried above that you are able. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't say above that you are able so that you don't fail the test, but will with make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it, whether it's a failure or not, you can get through it. You know what the way of escape always is? God's grace. Peter, he's being tested. It's the night of Jesus' crucifixion at trial. And he says, I don't know Jesus. Three times. He fell flat. Jesus said to him before that, I have prayed for you, Peter. Well, good luck with that prayer, Jesus. It didn't work. Or did it? Because three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus meets Peter and says, Peter, do you still love me? And Peter goes on to be the Apostle Peter, you know, the one that writes a lot of the Bible. <laughs> He's a victor, but he still, even then, is messed up. You understand that? That verse is not a promise that you won't fall. It's a promise that God will get you through that. <clears throat> if I play, 
I'll tell you, my understanding that verse as a promise that I won't fall caused me all kinds of problems because guess who fell? Right? <sighs> Temptation is to be tested. It's a struggle. And you can bear it even if you repeatedly fall. Bear it means you get through it with Jesus. That's all it means. Just go to Jesus and say the words. It's such a big deal. Just say, I need you. Yeah, I know I don't deserve you, but I need you. <coughs> Do you know how many times I have stayed away from God for a long time because I wasn't willing to say that? In fact, I'm going to guess that if you're here today, there is a chance that you might be here because you've been staying away from him for a while and you finally decided to come back. Isn't that true? Well, keep coming back. Quicker, faster. Keep coming back. Do you know that God is your cheerleader and helper in this? He is on your side. He'll run with you. He'll pick you up. He'll encourage you to keep going. He will say, you can do it. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I love this verse. Seeing you also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There are so many people that have come to Jesus and been like Gideon. He's on that list in Hebrews 11, by the way, Gideon is. They've come to Jesus, and he's gotten them through it. They've won, and they were all messed up. But they're, but they're, they're all saying, we struggled terribly, but we made it. You know how many of them made it? Every one of them. Let us lay aside every weight. That is the things in life that make you want to quit. When you want to quit, say, I'm getting rid of that. And every sin, those are the things that make you feel like you're not worth it. Get over them. Say, I'm sorry. And, and run with Patience. We all love that word, right? Run with patience. I was a long-distance runner, and I can remember times when my teammates came back and said, don't quit. They were my cheerleaders. They encouraged me. When I fell, fell behind, they encouraged me. Run with patience the race that is set before you. So a couple more things here. So you say, Pastor, you don't know what it feels like to struggle, and neither does God. Next slide. There we go. You don't know what it feels like to struggle, and neither does God. Well, let me tell you a secret. I know a little bit about what struggle feels like, but God knows, because it says that we have a high priest named Jesus, who is touched by the actual feeling of your infirmities because he became a man. And he loves us. Jesus knows what it's like to struggle. Feelings are liars, and they will keep you down for a long time if you let your feelings be your truth. I don't feel like God loves me anymore. Well, he does. Last week, Jacob preached on um, 2 Peter 1, 19. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Well, the more sure word of prophecy is the word of God, and it's more sure than your feelings and experiences because they are not a sure thing to put your life on. Amen? Because my feelings can go all over the place but God's word never changes. Here we go. 
when your feelings shake you up, and they do, and when life is dark, cling to the word of God and believe that he loves you. Lord, I thank you for this study on struggle with sin, the wretchedness of the struggle. I thank you that we win, that there's joy coming in the morning when we see you face to face. Lord, if someone's struggling this morning and needs to talk to me or talk to you about it, may they do so before they go home. In Jesus' name, amen.